Right. France just elected a new left-wing parliament with big spending plans, while the deficit is at an all-time high. On the other side of the Atlantic, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden seem eager to add to the U.S. record fiscal deficit, either in the form of tax cuts for Trump or industrial policy-related spending for Biden. Meanwhile, in Asia, rapidly aging countries with sky-high public debt, like Japan, are expected to pay more and more for retirement benefits. If a fiscal crisis happens in any of these major economies, it would almost certainly and instantaneously turn into a global financial crisis. But is such a fiscal crisis likely? And what can we learn from previous fiscal crises, such as the ones experienced in Europe? Or what can we expect from public debt dynamics in times of geopolitical turmoil? These are the questions that we shall discuss in this seminar where we have esteemed speakers such as ex-IMF economist Douglas Laxton, as well as the head of the research department at the Bank of Israel and Monetary Policy Committee member Adi Brender from the Bank of Israel. And finally, to provide feedback and reflection, we are also joined by esteemed professor Charles Goodhart from the London School of Economics. So without further ado, Let's get into the likelihood of a fiscal crisis through the lens of the corridor theory of financial instability with Doug Lexton. Okay, thanks, uh, Yuri. Uh, in past seminars, uh, Charles Goodhart uh, has raised the issue about how do we think about the ingredients for these different types of scenarios like case A and case B and Today, we're going to be talking about things like uh, X and Y, tail risk types of uh, scenarios. So I just want to tell you, uh, Charles, uh, that we also have developed something called the uh, market reference scenario, and we will be publishing updates of the market reference scenario every Thursday based on the latest estimates of the uh, expected path of the Fed funds rate, as well as what's priced into financial markets. And I mean, the entire term structure, BAA spreads and so on. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that because he will be able to see on a weekly basis how we're thinking about incorporating uh, different ingredients. Now, uh, these case A and case B to do scenarios are meant to be created by the students as a learning exercise. So we don't think that the case A and case B scenarios are necessarily unique. Uh, they could be motivated by, by different kinds of things. But today, what I wanna talk about is another question that Charles raised, which is, should we be talking about things that are related to political types of uh, considerations? So we're gonna talk a little bit about some possible scenarios and in fact, why we're concerned uh, that the probability of a global financial crisis uh, over the next five years is something real that we need to focus on. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me just talk that and say a few words about a paper uh, that we're writing for the future of macro. So David Vines has been editing a series on the future of macro where Olivier Blanchard and other people have weighed in about what we should be doing. The way that debate is going <clears throat> is actually in the direction of things that we've been doing for at least 30 years. So I wanna talk about one of the applications and actually an application that, that was actually applied to Israel. But in a recent conference, uh, Lord Mervyn King uh, said that we need models in which credibility of a central bank is endogenous in its action. So we, we created a, a website, a special page that has a reading list of all the work that we've done on models with endogenous monetary policy credibility. And that is going to feature uh, in this paper on the future of macro that we're writing uh, for the uh, Oxford series that David Vines has created. So the, the paper that I want to talk to today, uh, because Addy is going to be talking in depth about Israel, is a working paper that we put out uh, uh, with A.L. Argov, as well as Natan Epstein, Philip Cram, and David Rose uh, back in uh, 2007 and so on. And I just want to I just want to show you a chart. Uh, this is one of my favorite charts uh, of all time that shows that if you cut 
the interest rate uh, inappropriately, where there is a perception that the cut in interest rate is not consistent with the objectives of auditory policy, and there's some suspicion that basically it could be motivated by the perception of fiscal dominance. So I'm I'm looking at that red line on the screen right now, and you can see that there was this cut uh, the, where the red line uh, cut drops down, and that uh, incident uh, because it wasn't really clear what was going on, why the Bank of Israel was actually cutting interest rates, resulted in this humongous increase in the country risk premium. Uh, you can see that the shekel uh, depreciated massively. Israel, because of the history of dollarization, has a pretty thick index bond market, which means that uh, unlike many other countries in the world, we can look at the effects of inflation expectations as measured by the difference between the yield on index bonds and conventional bonds. This is uh, that green line. And you can see that medium term inflation expectations kind of ratcheted up. In Israel at the time, the elasticity between the exchange rate and the CPI because of the history of dollarization was 0.27. Uh, so the depreciation caused a uh, very rapid increase in inflation and actually required, as you can see in the picture, a much larger increase in the interest rate. Uh, a slide that I'm not sharing with you is what the real implications of this were, which is an increase in unemployment and a slowdown in growth. So this, in my mind, uh, is one of the great examples of data of how you can see endogenous monetary policy in action where the central bank cuts the rate, uh, in this case, by not very much, it's not viewed as being consistent with macro fundamentals, risk premium on the, uh, the country, risk premium increases, inflation expectations ratchet up, and they have to go through a period of really high interest rates to bring inflation expectations back to the target. This is just looking at the chart, comparing their 10-year bond rate uh, to U.S., uh, 10 year bond rates. And you can see on the left hand side that when we look at this in terms of the long term interest rate, it went from about uh, 7% up to 12%, uh, but it required a major fight uh, to re anchor inflation expectations and reduce long term interest rates. So I wanted to use that a little, a little bit as motivation uh, because if a cut in interest rate is, is perceived. Uh, to either be necessary to make the fiscal dynamics uh, stable or if it's perceived to be any form of fiscal dominance, then obviously we could have an sh upward shift in inflation expectations. And if we had an upward shift in inflation expectations, obviously long-term interest rates could rise. Now, why would that be potentially dangerous? And this is the introduction to what we describe as the corridor theory of financial instability. Put quite simply, uh, when we're fighting the lower bound, so there's obviously a lower bound on interest rates uh, that we can't get uh, below. And when we hit that effective lower bound, we've been using macro, we've been using unconventional monetary policies to effectively drive term premium down. And the argument that we make is that while that might work in the short run, uh, if it's successful at inflation uh, renormalizes and potentially overshoots, interest rates are going to rise. And what and the uh, the implications of doing the fighting uh, usually involves uh, an asset price bubble. Uh, and in the case of the United States, unfortunately, we haven't uh, updated that uh, chart. But when one looks at the uh, household balance sheet and how much it's growing since the end of the first quarter of 2020, uh, today, based on the latest data up to uh, the end of uh, the first quarter of this year, it's growing by $50 uh, trillion, okay, both the size of the aggregate uh, household assets and the size of net wealth. In other words, the difference between assets and liabilities. 
just to put that into perspective, uh, 2019 GDP in the United States was $21 trillion. So we've had a $50 trillion uh, increase in household wealth. It has been a result of a doubling in equity prices. The S&P has gone up from about 5,000 at the end of the first quarter of 2020 to over 10,000. It's around 10,500 today. So we have a humongous increase in equity prices, a large increase in property prices. And of course, during COVID, we also had some good old fashioned financial saving because of an increase in precautionary saving and plus consumers couldn't consume everything that, uh, that they wanted to consume. Some recent work uh, that we've done with Miriam uh, at the National Bank of Georgia uh, estimate standard consumption functions that feature uh, disposable income in this measure of household wealth. Those consumption functions had used to fit perfectly uh, before COVID and they're fitting perfectly again. So if one uses exactly the same parameters that were estimated pre-COVID, it fits consumption in 2023 and early 2024, as well as it did pre-COVID. So why haven't we had a recession? Because we've got a humongous increase uh, in financial wealth and asset price bubble. That is a result of trying to deal with this effect of lower bound issue, which is the bottom corridor in the interest rate chart. Now, what happens if that involves a large increase in government debt or even private sector debt that can put the the, the country uh, and the central bank in a very, very difficult position, because if the interest rate were to rise above some critical threshold, uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, in the case of the United States, the debt to GDP ratio is currently around 100 percent. And so if the interest rate were to rise to a number like 6 percent, the 10 year bond rate is currently 4.3 percent and so on. But if it were to rise to 6 percent, that would mean that the interest payments on debt would have to be 6 percent of GDP. In other words, because we have 100 percent debt to GDP ratio, a 6 percent interest rate would mean that a substantial part of the budget would be need to be allocated just to financing the interest obligations on the debt. What does that mean? What it means is that the current deficits in the United States, the, the primary deficit in the United States is about two and a half percent. And there's the difference between government expenditures and taxes. So that would have to swing into a big surplus to basically contain the explosive debt dynamics that would be associated with that high interest rate and the perception that fiscal dynamics were unstable. So there's obviously some critical threshold that interest rates can't rise above. What is that critical threshold a function of? Well, obviously the level of government debt and the degree of polarity, in other words, if governments can't get their act together, in other words, if you could not get a deal between the Republicans and the Democrats to cut expenditures quite quite enormously or raise taxes uh, quite enormously, then, of course, there would be nothing to stop people in the bond market from believing that the debt dynamics had become unstable. So I, I'm, I'm going to stop it there. And then maybe hopefully Addy can talk about the history of Israel, because Israel is a fascinating case, because after the stabilization policies in the 1980s, they managed to develop a macro framework that got effectively uh, uh, a credible framework that where they exited from this from this uh, this this period of a fiscal crisis and and uh, and and they got effectively lower uh, long term uh, interest rates and so on. So the the key idea is that in the case of countries like Italy, this is just a chart of the 10 year bond monthly data that shows that in the peak of the European debt crisis, 
an interest rate, a 10-year bond rate of 7% was around the critical threshold where people in the market thought the system just wasn't uh, stable and so on. So this, this, this critical threshold has probably shifted down because government debt has continued to grow in Italy and many other places and so on. So I think what I'll do is uh, uh, leave it uh, there and then maybe come back to some of these things in the end so that we can get uh, Charles's uh, feedback and so on. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, I think that's a, a really interesting chart that uh, you present that there with the um, upper bound of uh, fears of a fiscal crisis. It's something I hadn't seen uh, before. Uh, I think um, it's now time for the other panel members to to see if they have some feedback or, or comments. Uh, Professor Guthardt, do you want to start? Um, well, I agree very much with Doug on this one. And of course, it's already happened in the UK uh, with Liz Truss, uh, because she expanded expenditures very largely, trying to cut uh, taxation. And the bond market just assumed that the situation was unstable, unsustainable, um, and went uh severely negative partly of course because of a structural uh problem with the pension funds uh ldi which i won't go into um and uh the um result of that was to make the bank of england uh, change temporarily from qt back to qe and i think that the danger when we get to um, potentiality for a debt crisis is not that the central banks will cut interest rates in order to make the fiscal position more better, but that they will be encouraged to undertake, again, large-scale quantitative easing to expand the money supply by buying up the debt that nobody else wants, so that the uh, problem is not going to be so much a a patently improper cut in interest rates, but a very large increase in the money stock. Um, and that, in turn, will likely to raise inflation just as much as a cut in interest rates. So um, it's already happened, and it happened in my country, the UK. I think that what happened with Liz Truss in uh, October 22 is simply a canary in the coal mine. I mean, this was a situation uh, which, because of debt dynamics and unwillingness to raise taxation, uh, inability to cut expenditures, is going to face many more countries in the foreseeable future. All right. Thank you. Uh, before we move to Adi, actually, Professor Goodhart, can I ask you a clarification question, uh, which is um, QE didn't seem at least to have caused a lot of inflation uh, before the pandemic. So what's what's different now? Is it like directly that they're in um, because they're buying assets from pension funds, etc. They're increasing the money supply. But how how would that lead to inflation or would that be more indirect that it enables the government to keep spending more? And therefore, uh, we we will see inflation as a consequence of QE now, but not before the pandemic. Well, it did lead to asset price inflation. It didn't lead to goods and services price inflation because interest rates were so extraordinarily low and lower than the rate of growth of the of, of nominal incomes um, that the debt dynamics seemed to be sustainable. Uh, but since then, uh, growth has, if anything, weakened further and interest rates have, have increased quite sharply. It's the interrelationships between G growth and our interest rates that's so important in this particular field. And that relativity has worsened really quite a lot uh, over the years uh, since about uh, 2021. So do you think um, then that we're no longer in this uh, low inflation paradigm that, that we were before the pandemic? Yes, I think that we are not. I think that there were many re structural reasons for massive disinflation, uh, particularly in the year between the great financial crisis and the outbreak of COVID. Uh, 
by enduring these years, central banks were trying their damnedest to be as expansionary as they could, interest rates down to the effective lower bound, massive QE, and they still could not raise um, the rate of inflation back to the target of 2%. So there must have been very, very strong underlying disinflationary forces, which were demographic and geopolitical. And both of these sort of underlying structural forces have gone strongly into reverse. Yeah, with the geopolitics being sort of the competition uh, with industrial policy and then the, the demographic one being um, that people are now getting older and starting to spend more. Uh, no, the demographic sort of one yours, is right? the, decline, the decline in working populations of the advanced economies um, and uh, the uh, geopolitical problems with um, the... the, the shift towards um, a much more protectionist uh, approach uh, that we see particularly uh, developing in the US, being followed in, in Europe and elsewhere. So the world's trading system is ceasing to be a liberal open system, and is becoming a much more nativist protectionist one. Very clear. Thank you so much. Uh, I... I... Oh, sorry, Doug, you want to respond? Is it, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Charles to get a little bit of feedback because I, I want to take a stab at, at kind of answering uh, uh, your question, Yuri, because there's not really that much of a puzzle, okay? Uh, if you embrace uh, the concept of endogenous money creation, okay? Uh, so this is the idea that how is money created well through the process of of giving loans to people okay and then of course we know what the initial loans are used for but we never know what's going to happen after after that in the in the second stage but we know that money can be used to purchase consumption goods we know it can be used to purchase investment goods and we know it can be used to purchase existing assets at really high prices and so on. So when you look at our consumption functions that have those asset prices in them, they're fitting perfectly again. So that's why we don't have a recession. That's why unemployment has stayed low. The, the only thing that maybe is a bit of a surprise is why inflation expectations, longer term inflation expectations have remained so anchored. That's kind of the, the puzzle, but that's the question. Will that continue to be so? The, the current term premium that are built into long-term interest rates are just slightly positive. Uh, when you take a look at the market and what's priced in options market, the expected uh, neutral interest rate is around 4%. And so if we were to get some type of inflationary shock, then it's quite reasonable that the term premium could snap back to the types of levels that we saw before the great moderation or even to 1% during the great moderation. If we did, that would take us into a territory where the interest rate would be higher than the growth rate of the economy and the, the fiscal dynamics would therefore become more unstable. Now, of course, once people saw that the fiscal dynamics were unstable, they would demand an even higher uh, term premium to compensate them for potentially higher interest rates uh, in the future. So I wanted to ask Charles, uh, I don't really see that there's much of a puzzle there because the higher asset prices have increased wealth and can explain why consumption is held up despite a 500 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate. But I'm interested in uh, what Charles and Addy, uh, Addy is obviously a, a a real world central banker and Charles has an incredible amount of experience uh, thinking about that. But how, what's your reaction to those thoughts? I think you're right. I agree. I, I don't think there is a particular puzzle. It's not that there's a puzzle, there's a problem, and we haven't solved the potential problem yet. Uh, <clears throat> I also I agree with your analysis. I, I think that if anything, the puzzle was in the previous decade uh, how long we needed to to go with this very aggressive uh, monetary policy 
uh, until we got uh, inflation back. Um, but um, as Charles said, there are good reasons uh, why it was there, demographics uh, and expansion of trade, et cetera, et cetera, all, all the known reasons. Um, uh, but I think that the key thing there and now is um, to, to really take things in a perspective. I, I think that uh, policymakers uh, and academics to a large extent were very lenient in assuming that this uh, extraordinary decade is going to proceed into the future, all this discussion about uh, is effective lower bound for a very long period, all those analysis that we have seen taking those zero interest rates into the future. Uh, I, I think the same mechanics that were working there in terms of QE and other mechanisms to keep long-term interest rates low were misguiding policymakers to think that uh, expansionary fiscal policies can persist forever. Uh, and I think that this is where uh, eventually we may find the trouble because it's once you get addicted, it's very difficult to go back. And I think that policymakers around the world got addicted to these easy policy, very loose fiscal policies. And uh, they find it very difficult to correct this before there is a crisis. And we know, I mean, we draw all these ex exploding uh, fiscal paths for various countries. We know that we won't get there, but we will get to the point where markets lose uh, faith in policymakers. That's the point of correction. We see that again and again and again. It happens well below the exploding point. And, and basically, you know, we at that point, there is a correction. The problem is that, of course, once you do that uh, in a interruptive way, in a, under pressure, it is very difficult to adopt the better programs, the growth supporting programs. Uh, these are ad hoc ad adjustments. In a way, you show the experience of Israel in uh, 2003. Uh, but, uh, and actually, if you go a little bit on the same slide, in the three years, it took Israel three years uh, to correct fiscal policy, making all the possible mistakes before we got it right. Uh, but then we got it right. And actually, my slides in my presentation, I'll show how it affected our pre preparedness for the current crisis, for the current geopolitical shock. Uh, and that really affects the ability to withstand shocks. And I think that that's the problem today. If we look at basically all the major central countries, central banks in the world, none of these countries is prepared to absorb a serious shock. I think we got over COVID somehow. Some of the countries are not really recovering fully from that. We carry even a higher public debt than we did before. And with higher interest rates, this is just leaving very little fiscal space to withstand another shock. And the shocks seem to be coming faster and faster between, with smaller gaps between them. I think that uh, that sounded like the perfect introduction for your presentation, uh, Adi. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to make sure that uh, Professor Goodhart and um, Doc uh, uh, agree with me that this is the perfect time to go to uh, Adi's presentation. Agreed. All right, excellent. And then before you start, I just want to say... I'm keeping an eye on the time because Professor Goodhart might have to leave early. So Adi, if you uh, if you can agree, you know I might stop your presentation uh, so that just to give Professor Goodhart a chance to to provide you with some comments. Uh, would that be okay? Yeah, no problem. Just keep in mind I kept my best slides to the end. So, <laughs> all right. But anyway, so I'm sharing from my screen. Yeah, I don't um, see it yet, but uh, feel free to go go for it. Yeah, I think it's starting. Okay. Yeah. Now I just have to make sure it's in presentation mode. Um, okay, now you see it on full screen, right? No, no, we still see the... But potentially you have to share the screen again and then uh, only the presentation mode. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Uh, okay, so, oh. now it's working? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So um, I'll be talking about uh, the current geopolitical shock. Israel is in a... Uh, war since um, October 7th. Um, the war 
is the longest we had since 1948-49, which was Israel's independence war. Uh, and this has, of course, significant effects on the economy. Uh, and because I was talking about being prepared, I want to start with a very quick few slides um, that will talk about how the Israeli economy entered the war. So we got into this war uh, after COVID. Um, as you can see here, of course, there was a drop in GDP immediately when we got into COVID, uh, basically a drop of 9% of GDP uh, during the second quarter of 2020. Then you can see a recovery. And by the end of 2021, we got back to the trend, the pre-COVID trend. So it's not only to the absolute level of GDP, but we've basically closed the output gap. And since the end of uh, 2021, the economy was slightly above trend in terms of uh, uh, GDP level, uh, growing at uh, pretty much the pre-COVID trend, but staying at the level above the trend. Um, this was, of course, accompanied by historically low unemployment rates and very tight labor market. You can see the green line is the unemployment rate. And on the top, you can see the participation rate and the employment rate, all very high, all very high, tight labor market, uh, also reflected in the, some a beginning of increase in real wages. In terms of public debt, here is the episode that uh, Doug was talking about. This is 2003. Israel had a growing uh, public debt up to 2003. Here, here there was a major consolidation program of the government that basically got the, public, the debt to GDP ratio to about 60% just before COVID. During COVID, we had a sharp increase in public debt, of course, like many other countries, all the support programs, uh, loss of revenue because of the decline in GDP, but with a very strong recovery and tightening fiscal policy, and to be honest, some unusual uh, one-off uh, tax revenues that were coming from the real estate sector. Basically, at the end of 2022, we got the debt to GDP ratio back to 60%. And we were on trend to 58 or 57% by the end of 2023 and with a budget surplus. Um, so that was in terms of uh, having the fiscal accounts, uh, keeping the, the country ready to face crisis, uh, developing the fiscal space, the policy space, also uh, for monetary policy to deal with a potential crisis. Of course, living in the neighborhood we live in, that is perceived as a necessity, especially since the experience of uh, 2003, uh, where we really were very close to a financial crisis by many indications. Um, also on the inflation front, uh, we were on the path or a smooth landing from the post COVID inflation. As you can see, inflation was declining towards the target range. In Israel, the inflation target is uh, in the range of 1% to 3%. Generally, we try to aim to the 2% uh, uh, because the 1% to 3 are needed to allow for uh, various deviations that are coming from uh, unusual events. We're not looking at the uh, core inflation. The target is for the uh, total inflation. So... Uh, the one to three are, allow, are used to allow for deviations because of uh, specific factors, but uh, we were on our way to reach the uh, inf uh, inflation target. In fact, during the beginning of 2024, we got into we got to within the target range. Uh, here you can see a comparison. So Israeli inflation was lower than uh, most OECD countries. You can look uh, at the median, but this is also tr true for the 25th to 75th percentiles or even the 90th percentile. And also if we look at core inflation, taking out to the energy prices, of course, which were a major factor of the inflation shock in Europe, uh, Israeli core inflation was also lower than other OECD countries. So this is in terms of... Uh, being in a good position to face a crisis. The Israeli economy was robust, uh, 
strong fiscal accounts, uh, all the things you need if you need if you're going to face a, a crisis, and and that's where the war matters. Now I'm going to have a short pause uh, to show a, an analytical tool that we're using. And that is based on a series of papers that we wrote to evaluate what affects real yields on government bonds, what affects the interest rate that the government is paying on its debt. And I was uh, part of uh, some of these, most of these papers. Uh, basically, we were looking at, uh, I'm not going to get into the econometrics of that. Uh, that's uh, not for, for the, this kind of talk. But basically, we're trying to look at the effects of various variables like monetary policy of the central bank, fiscal policy, growth, geopolitical shocks to the economy, and global interest rates as key factors affecting the yields on Israeli government bonds. Um, we were also allowing for a time changing uh, the fiscal variables. Um, is it just me or uh, did we lose Adi? I've lost him. Lost. Yeah, we lost okay. him. Okay, let's uh, let's pause for a little bit then and hope that he returns. I think oh, I think he's back. Adi, can uh, can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you have to reshare your screen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me see that. Sorry, that's the internet connection here. All right, please uh, continue. Um, okay, so th these are. I don't know if you heard me uh, talking about the model. Uh, Basically, these are the key uh, results. And of course, I'm focusing here on the government debt. Uh, and what we can see is that there is a strong statistically significant effect of the expected government debt to GDP ratio. Uh, also, there is an effect of the central bank interest rate, even on the longer term, the 10 year. What we see here, you know, the, the red line is the 10 year bond um and then we uh, the green line is the one year bond and then in between there are the three and the five so you can see that these are the key variables and also we can see the intensifying effect of government of the debt to gdp ratio on the yields as we move over the years especially after 2008 these were the these were the years where uh, the debt effect has increased um adi can you maybe do a yeah. quick Quick recap of the model, because I think uh, we lost you a little bit at that point, and I, I wasn't <laughs> sure what, what it meant in relation to the chart you were showing. Uh, okay, so basically we estimated a model where the dependent variable is real yields on government bonds, uh, looking at the one, three, five, and 10-year uh, bonds, and also on the forward uh, rates. And then estimating, a host, I'm not getting into the econometrics of the model, but basically looking at the host of variables the central bank interest rate, uh, debt to GDP ratio, global interest rates, and uh, some effects on the of the real economy like GDP growth and geopolitical shocks to the Israeli economy. And uh, uh, variables, rolling regression. And um, the most interesting one, of course, is the ex uh, expected debt to GDP ratio. So we see a clear, signif statistically significant effect of the debt to GDP ratio on the yields. And especially on the 10 years, but also on the five years, it's increasing as we move along. And especially after 2008, the years on the X axis are the first year of the seven year rolling regression. So 2007 means that these are the coefficients for the years 2007 to 2014, especially after the GFC. And we see the increasing effect. What I want you to take from here is that eventually the coefficient that we get is about 0 0.1. So every 1% increase in the debt to GDP ratio is associated with an increase of 10 basis points in the yield on government bonds, slightly moving between 0 0.08 on the shorter term to 0.12 on the longer term. I go back to that number at the end. And another interesting thing in terms of credibility is that the, in a previous version of the model, we found that the deficit targets adopted by the government also had a significant effect on the yields. And this has disappeared over the years. And the reason, of course, to anyone who knows the Israeli economy is, the, is that the government never adhered by those targets. So eventually the markets just ignored them. 
So this is nice to see in terms of the coefficients, how actual behavior is reflected also in the market sentiment. Initially, if a government states it is going to do something, the market's actually related to that, and then they just learn to ignore it. Uh, but eventually the debt to GDP ratio, the predicted debt to GDP ratio was the key variable in terms of fiscal policy effect on the yields. And also, uh, especially the unexpected, unexpected shocks in terms of monetary policy are affecting the yields. Interestingly enough, even the long-term yield of the forward of the five to 10 years is also affected to some extent, but statistically significant by the surprises in monetary policy. And um, what you see here is how, if we take the model coefficients and relate them to the actual changes in, uh, uh, in policy, uh, what was their contribution to changes in the yield? So you can see, for example, in the blue, which is a focus and looking at the 10 years, you can see that it was a, uh, the fiscal consolidation in 2001 to 2003 was associated with a significant decrease in the yields uh, alongside the effects of um, the monetary policy. Um, fiscal expansion later on with tax reductions was associated with, um, um, sorry, uh, fiscal continued fiscal consolidation was also uh, associated here with further decline. And then later on, uh, as we move from 2009 to 2013, uh, we see an even larger contribution. So basically, uh, if you look at the blue all over, uh, fiscal policy has a significant effect on yields. The markets are reacting uh, to the debt to GDP ratio and pretty much with a consistent coefficient. So I think that this is the key uh, variable that interests us today when we look at the, this, at the current situation of the Israeli economy. So I'll leave the other coefficients to anyone who wants to read the paper. Uh, a follow-up analysis that we did in 2019, I looked at the results all the way to 2017. Basically, the colors have changed here, uh, but the public debt effect is still here. In the last few years, from 2013 to 2017, the impact, the green, here it is green, uh, the effect of public debt reduction is smaller simply because there was no uh, significant public debt reduction during that period. The coefficient remained relatively stable at about the 0 0.1 that I mentioned before. So all of this is taking us now to the beginning of the war. And firstly, what I want to show you, if you look at the red lines here, is that the Israeli economy has learned to withstand crisis relatively well. Every time we had a crisis, these are the red uh, downward uh, looking uh, bars. Um, we had a very strong recovery uh, in terms of growth. So the economy learned to absorb the shocks and very quickly re uh, rebound uh, in terms of activity. This is the last shock, the last quarter of 2023 we had a decline of 21.6 in annual terms in GDP. That's about 5.7%. We recovered about two thirds of this in the first quarter of uh, 2024. Not much more in the second quarter. We still only have uh, now casting, but not, not official data on the second quarter. But uh, we think that the growth has moderated significantly in the second quarter. And of course, the war is still lingering so its effects on the economy uh, are more com are more complicated than all these previous crises that were really ending within several weeks each time. Um, as a uh, result, Adi, uh, yes, I think uh, Professor Goodhart has to go in five minutes, if I'm correct. Uh, and I can clearly see that uh, some of your most interesting slides are still coming. But I just wanted to provide. Uh, Professor Goodhart, uh, the opportunity to to ask uh, some questions, uh, either about the slides that he has seen so far or about uh, Israel's economy. Uh, no, I've really, I've really no particular point to make. All I can say is that I congratulate um, Adi and the Bank of Israel that uh, there's really been no discussion of uh, financial frailties in Israel as a result of the current hostilities. 
And so I think you're doing a great job. Um, I would have been very glad to have stayed on to listen further to what you have to say, but I'm afraid I have got to go. But please continue. And I, <laughs> I assume that I will be leaving uh, while you're in midstream. Uh, okay, right. I'll, I actually have three more slides, so I hope you see the bottom line. Anyway, here is on on the first slide uh, that I, I still have left. I'm just showing you the fiscal picture. So as I said, we got back to about 60% of GDP in terms of the debt to GDP ratio in 2022. We were on our way to 56, 57 to 58 in 2023, but because the war started in October, the last quarter pushed us up to 62%, and we think that we're going to finish 2024 at about 67.5. And then there are various scenarios as to where fiscal policy is going to be. Uh, the black line is our baseline scenario, which assumes a fiscal consolidation in the order of magnitude of 2% of GDP. These are fiscal policy measures in that magnitude because they are offsetting uh, required expenditures that are coming due to the war, mostly military expenditure, but also compensation for uh, victims of uh, the hostilities, uh, many refugees from the northern and south southern parts of Israel that cannot live in their homes uh, because of the hostilities, so the government has to compensate them. But we're assuming in our baseline scenario, actually, we just published yesterday our staff forecast for uh, the next quarter, um, which goes all the way to the end of 2025. And with that uh, consolidation, we see the debt to GDP ratio stabilizing uh, basically in 2025, going up by one percentage point of GDP and then coming down gradually. There are, of course, other scenarios like the one in orange, which shows basically further slowdown in the economy, higher defense expenditures. Uh, but but uh, let, let's stick to the baseline scenario. So basically, compared to where we were supposed to be um, before the war, the debt to GDP ratio is now about 10 percentage points higher. Remember, uh, if you saw the coefficients uh, I showed in, in the previous slides, that would mean an increase of about one percentage point in the risk premium and then in the uh, cost of government debt. Um, here, just to show you before that, uh, when the war began, uh, financial markets were responding nervously. The exchange rate was depreciating uh, quite substantially. The Bank of Israel announced an intervention. We said that we may spend up to $30 billion to support the exchange rate. Uh, at the end of the day, we had to use only about $7 billion during the month of October. And then, as you can see, the exchange rate has depreci actually appreciated relative to the beginning of the war, and it is still below the pre-war level. And we did not have to intervene again since the end of October. Um, but more related to our point, um, sorry, uh, you can see you can see here that the C <laughs> the CDS rates for Israel in the blue line have jumped in the beginning of the war by about 100 basis points and basically stayed there. There are fluctuations depending on developments of the war, fiscal news from various uh, sources, but basically we are stuck at about 100, point, 100 basis points higher rate in terms of the CDs, uh, CDS. Sorry. Um, you can see Israel in the dark blue and light blue here. And again, you see about 87 basis points increase in the gap between dollar-denominated Israeli government bonds and U.S. government bonds, very similar to this 100 basis points uh, that uh, we see in the CDS. And also that Israel is basically trading uh,